from Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. My heading is Controversy Over Sabbath Healing. He entered again into a synagogue, and a man there whose hand was withered. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to serve a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hard, hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately be began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. All right, let's take a moment to greet our neighbors. Sorry, I got distracted by a baby who's not going to be a baby for much, much longer. He's getting big. So I had to say hi to my little friend. How is everybody doing today? It feels sleepy in here. The stand up and do some jumping jacks in a minute or something like that. So uh, welcome. Glad to see everybody here. Um, we're in the book of Mark chapter 3, verses, uh, verses 1, through, 1 through 6 this morning. Um, it's funny, I was actually talking with... Uh, Pastor John, this morning, as we were going over a lot of different elements of the church, and, you know, one of the things that we said is uh, Transcend Church was planted, I'm really bad with the calendar, I'm going to say eight years ago, but I'll, I've probably said eight before, or I've said six, so one of these days we'll, we'll figure that out, but um, no matter, we talked about the fact that many of us have probably come from larger church environments, perhaps, maybe um, church environments where the church itself does a lot of things, and we can kind of get buried in that definition and start to think of the church as doing things. When the church really doesn't do anything, the church is just kind of a structure. It's a structure that Jesus created. It's the structure that we serve within, but the church itself really doesn't do anything. The church doesn't do outreach. It's people do. The church doesn't share the gospel. It's people do. And so when it's people do things, then effectively the church is serving. We become the, the hands and feet of Jesus doing the will of God in our spheres of influence. And so one of the things that I hope that isn't missed um, at, at the church, one of the things that maybe we do that's different, I don't know, I don't visit a whole lot of churches, um, but one of the things that we do maybe I think that's different, I hope it's not, but, but maybe it is, is everything that we do, um, and we're willing to do this to a fault, is going to be central to Scripture, centered around Scripture. So, so everything from even referring to this, like I have pet peeves, this whole area up here is not a stage, it's a platform for gospel proclamation. Uh, stages are prefer for performance, uh, platforms are for messages, and so we don't stand um, on, a, on a stage. And so I hope when you come here, you're expectant, you're excited, you're hungry for the Word of God to see what it says about your life. Um, to see what it reveals to be true about God. It's the only authority by which we can know God. You can't make up things about God. I mean, you can, they just might not be true. 
Um, and so, we, you know, we desire to be truthful, to be understanding, to learn more about God, to, to know that the word itself says it goes out for a purpose and it doesn't return void. So, what, God, what is your purpose in my hearing of this word today? So, as we look at Mark chapter 3, we'll look at three points. We'll find three points in the passage. Um, one is that this whole scene, the whole scene that we'll read about this morning, was set up to show hardness of heart, hard hearts. So that's kind of an odd phrase if, if, if you're new to church, hard heart, I, it's straight, it doesn't mean anything, right? So if you think about the heart is the center of who you are, if the center of who you are is hardened, it wants to let nothing in, it wants to be affected by nothing, and so the whole point of this scene is to show you your hardened heart. Because the problem is we only have our own perspective. And so if our heart is hard, we might not know that. If we're resistant to truth, we might not know that. Um, I know in, in my own life, experiencing hardness of heart has, has come in strange ways. And when you step back and think about it, it becomes more obvious. Uh, a hard heart is angered with the message of Christ. If you hear about Jesus, if you hear about gospel, and you just feel angst and uneasy and frustration and possibly anger... That might be a hard heart in you. Why would you react angrily towards a message? Second, it gives a healthy view of rest. Um, I think we can have a sick, sick view of rest, including the rest of Sabbath. I think we can have a very sick view of that. And so the passage today gives a healthy view of rest. And finally, we see that God's good heart and motives are on plain display. Those are the three things we'll see. One, this whole scene is set up to show hardness of heart. Two, it gives a healthy view of rest. And three, God's good heart and motives, or movies, perhaps it says on the screen as I've written it down. Actually, I'll just, Justin was the last person to touch it, so it's Justin's fault. Justin, give a wave. Does it say movies? Awesome, awesome. Glad I could do that for you guys. I'll be here all day. In these six verses, we'll see an undertone of the story that is God's gospel. I love that about this passage. It's not about a man with a withered hand. Your Bible probably says that. It's not about that. There's a man with a withered hand here, but you're going to find that he is in the background. So let's, let's, just, let's jump in. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We're going we're gonna to start a little bit slow. And again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. Now, this isn't strange for Jesus to, to, to head into the synagogue. We see it in chapter 1, verse 21, and chapter 1, verse 39. This is very normal for Jesus. Now, Jesus lives in this time frame that I love. I'm somewhat obsessed with this transitional period in history where Jesus is preaching about the kingdom to come, and he is the kingdom to come. He is fulfilling the law, and he'll create a world whereby the law has, has been fulfilled, and the church will continue on, God's mission for people. So Jesus kind of stands in this, in this middle ground, and it's important to under, understand that. So it's a very normal thing that Jesus would be in the synagogue on the Sabbath, worshiping and teaching there's one scene, and, and if, if, if we're new to one another, I talk about scenes in the Bible, because I, I see, I'm visual, so I see these things playing out, because they actually happen. Um, and so there, there's a scene in the scriptures where Jesus comes, and, and, and they offer a scroll to him to teach from. He opens it up, and lo and behold, it just happens to be a passage about him and how he'll come and live among the people. So Jesus was commonly in the synagogue. Just a quick mental note. Mark is telling the story of the healing of the man with the withered hand. You can see it also in Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 13. So if you want to continue studying about this, look at Matthew 12, 9 through 13. And Mark, where we are, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We've said often that Mark um, has a fast and furious pace. He's moving quickly through these gospel stories. Sometimes he'll give a little less detail than others. Um, sometimes he'll give more detail than others. He's always at a quick clip trying to show and impress on us the importance of the gospel that Jesus was 
leaving behind. And so we're going to see this story start with a man with a withered hand. And then for the rest of the five verses, we'll see almost nothing about him at all. He's the starting point for the setup that shows us a hardness of heart. And, and I know that can sound harsh. We don't want to be shown where we're wrong. Right? If you're like me, it's, it's probably a character flaw. See, I say probably because I won't even admit it. As soon as someone tells me I'm wrong, I immediately react and I say that I'm not. And I show you all the ways that I'm not wrong. But I'll often think about it later and go, doggone it, they're right. And that hurts even worse than hearing it in the very beginning. We need some outside perspective on ourselves. Because in our minds, we can justify everything we do. We're really good at it. Really good at it. Whether that is speeding, whatever it is, we know the reason why that is okay for us because our internal monologue kind of coddles us. And so the Spirit of God, part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Which is incredible because the Holy Spirit comes and lives in the believer. Which means you, as a believer, redeemed, reborn, remade, and renewed, who are being constantly transformed by the renewing of your mind, need to be reminded of those things. Yes, even you, a believer, have sin still. And so this whole thing is a setup to show hardness of heart, and it's very loving. I know after my salvation, I remember thinking back of Christians that were around me, and I remember thinking, you guys knew all of this to be true, and you never told me? I couldn't believe it. I remember being very frustrated with people. Like, you just hung out with me, and you knew all this stuff? You saw my life and how crazy it was? You knew the God who could redeem and save me, and you never told me? I remember for the first time ever hearing, I almost said hurting, I already wrote, I already revealed that I can't spell, so now I can't speak. I remember for the first time ever hearing the Bible taught. I don't know if people didn't teach it growing up in environments that I was in, but I always heard it as, a statement that you read really quickly so you can say the things that you want to say and crack a few sweet jokes. And then I remember hearing the scriptures taught and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is real. This talks about real people in real places. And then hearing some kind of fast facts on scripture. That these books were written by people who never knew one another on different continents over periods of perhaps a thousand or more years. By people who never once talked, but it tells one story, that it's internally consistent, that it had no errors. And I grew up saying, well, the Bible was, it's unreliable. It's passed from ear to ear to ear. It's orally transmitted. It's full of errors. But the problem with that is the Bible itself and the facts around it. The transmission of the Bible argues completely against that. In fact, we had a, had a Bible that was put together from fragments for thousands of years, was passed on through people. And then one day a cave in the ground was found. People go underground and they find all these scrolls. They call them the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can see them with your eyes. They've been x-rayed and pulled apart and open. And we find them to be within 99% reliability of all the text that we already heard. So what about this ear to ear to ear certainly being full of errors? It's internally consistent and it stands for itself. And I remember hearing it taught and thinking, oh my gosh, this is real. And so when this thing that is real starts to make really bold claims about who we are as people, it should be impactful. When it shows me that my heart is hard and resistant towards God, and that really resonates with me, and I say, oh my gosh, why is my heart hard towards God? And then it starts to say, hey, that hard heart is because you're separated from God because he's holy and holy means different set apart materially different yes but but different morally and not morally like doesn't watch hot tub time machine but morally like his character the root of who he is is love and he would have no anger in him he is materially and morally different than me he is perfect and I'm separated from that because I'm not and then the gospel comes in and tells a crazy story. It says, you're all messed up, and I know this about you. Don't hide from me. It didn't work well from Adam, right? Adam, where are you? Hiding from God. 
He asks Adam, where are you? Think about yourself. Look into your heart. What is this hardness that you've built up against me, Adam? And so this whole thing is a setup to show the hardness of hearts. Jesus, craftily, we'll see, exposes this in them, but also leaves behind a template for us to see. Is this in me? If you will, write, write this down. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and, and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Here's what it says. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the, face, in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed fail to meet the test. This is written to believers. It's not saying, hey, unbeliever, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Hey, you're not. You're not a believer. I mean, that's pretty easy, right? Um, this is written to the believer to test yourself to see if you're in the faith. There should be some fruit in you. There should be some fruit in your life. There should be some fruit in your heart. Now, I want to be really careful because I don't want to leave you with a, a, a guilt or a burden to constantly be saying, I don't know, God, I don't know if I see the fruit in my life. I don't know if I, if I feel you. Some people show up at a concert and they feel you. They show up at a fire, something with the word fire in it. And, and they know that they're going to expect an experience because the billboard says God never fails to show up at this thing that we put on every year. He always does a big thing in you and I don't feel a big thing. God, are you there? It's why it's important to have other believers around you and ask them, be like, dude, I feel numb. What do you see in my life? Are there evidences of grace on me? And your believing friends will pray for you and start to talk with you. But I want to encourage you in this. When you were dead in your sin and trespass, as the book of Romans describes you, dead in your sin and trespass, how frequently did you lay in bed awake at night and say, God, I don't know if I feel you enough. I don't know if I'm alive in you. I don't know if my heart cares about you because you're dead. You don't care. So caring in itself, wondering in itself, struggling in itself should be an encouragement to you that you are found in Christ. Does that mean you're where you should be? I don't know. Maybe you should grow, right? That's, I mean, Scripture encourages it. It says that you will be being renewed in your mind through the Scriptures. Maybe you need to get into your Bible. Maybe you need to pray. Maybe you definitely need to do those things, no matter how you feel. And so the believers in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 are encouraged to examine themselves. You know, we could do that this week, today, right now, tomorrow. Examine yourselves. Verse 2. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him this is where it starts this is where we start to see the hardness of hearts this is where we start to see what jesus is doing what he's revealing what he's allowing them to see this whole thing is a setup to show the hardness of hearts my man with the withered hand is gone from the story already we're in verse two and the guy who the heading in your bible says this is about has just vanished this became about something else All that the Pharisees were there to do was to watch Jesus. You see that in verse 2, and they watched Jesus. You know, you would think maybe, oh, they watched Jesus because they wanted to learn from him. Because, gee whiz, he seemed really insightful. Or they watched Jesus because, you know, everybody was following him, and it was pretty crazy that all these people are into this weird dude. Or they watched Jesus to see what he could teach them. Or they watched Jesus to see what his message might be. No, they watch Jesus with an agenda. You probably know someone like that. I've tested people on this before. Um, I remember talking to a relative one time about another relative, and I said, that person just wants to argue. I said, check this out. And I went to that relative, and I said, did you know that the sky is blue? Kid you not. This is, you can't make this stuff up. This relative said, well, actually, it's not blue. I'm like, nope, that's all right. No, we're done. You, you did it. You did exactly what I hoped you would do. Prove my point. Some people, when they hear you, 
I'm convinced in the back of their mind, or, or here's, what's, here's the mantra that's rattling off in the back of their mind. Oh, shoot, quick, 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 quick. What are they saying that's wrong? Where can I correct them? That's what's happening here in the way that the Pharisees are approaching Jesus. I mean, look, look at verse 2. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. That's really important. They're watching Jesus with a purpose. The purpose was that they could accuse him. They're watching him to accuse him. The dude with the withered hand is just kind of a victim in this whole, <laughs> this whole situation, except he's going to get the hookup, so don't feel too bad. All right, he's going to get a fresh hand. I bet it was like mega strong, too. He's like, here's my strong hand. Um, so let's see, what does Jesus do? Does he sidestep? Does he go with it? Where's Jesus at in this? Verse 3, and he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. I don't know how it went, actually. He said, come here. I, maybe it was nice. Maybe he didn't do one of those. But he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. Why? The Pharisees showed up, and they're there to watch Jesus, to see if he'll heal on the Sabbath day. Jesus looks around. He's like, you with the hand, come here. Jesus is ready for this showdown to happen. Jesus calls the guy who is ready for healing on the Sabbath while people are there to see if he'll heal so they can accuse him. And he points at the guy that needs some healing and he says, you there, come to me. And I don't know how long it took him to come to Jesus. Was he close by Jesus? Was he hinting at it? Like, I don't know, like, like my kids, they think they drop subtle hints, but they're obvious. And so you just, you don't want to respond to them sometimes because they're so obvious. It was he like, uh, gee, I sure wish somebody would heal this crazy hand today. Or did Jesus perceive the situation? Did the Pharisees plant this guy in the room and say, Jesus is going to notice that. We know he's healing. Let's see if he'll do it. We don't know all those background details. But what we know is Jesus finds the guy and he says, hey, hey, come here. Verse 4. And he said to them, them being the Pharisees, is he holding the guy's hand at this point? I don't know. Is, is, has the guy made it over to him? But he says to them, the Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? Now, the guy with the withered hand, when he got to the kill part, was probably a little stressed. But they were silent. This is odd. There's some strange stuff going on here. The Pharisees show up so that they can see if Jesus will heal this guy because it's the Sabbath day. And we'll talk about the Sabbath day in a little bit of detail here in a couple seconds. Jesus buys into the whole thing. By his grace, he's going to show them their hardness of their hearts through this whole situation. He says, hey guys, hey, uh, withered hand guy, come here. And then while he's got the withered hand guy there, he looks at other people the Pharisees, who are there to watch him, and he says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? Why? Why is Jesus doing this? What's, what's this Sabbath thing? Another scripture reference to write down if you're, I pray, going through this stuff this week, thinking through it in your head. Genesis 2, verses 2 through 3. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So in six days... God created all of the complexity in the amazing depth of life. Everything that occurs around us, cell division. Have you ever watched the videos they have of like a cellular motor? It's the nuttiest stuff you'll ever see. They look like a little like, like stick figure. And that, sometimes they'll be different colors. I feel like they're making that part up. But it'll look almost like a little stick figure. And it's like holding like a ball on its back. And, and I'm going to get out of my league here. I'm, I'm more in my league with the stick figure part. But then it goes into like the nucleus of a cell and takes something out and carries it down the mitochondria and puts it somewhere else. 
and, and then it kind of like walks off and it keeps doing this. And all of these things are happening so that your body can reproduce cells and do all the really weird things that your body does. Like, I have this weird thing that happens to me. I call them brain blips. I don't know what it's about, but like I'll be talking and then my body will just kind of go, and I'll make a weird sound. Often it'll happen on conference calls. Um, but I, it, it lays over with this weird nightmare I have where my face is being electrocuted. Like, well, I'll be asleep and a ball of electricity will be coming at me. And then it hits me and I, I feel a zap and I wake up from it. The brain and the body and the mind are so amazingly complex. I have never had to remind myself to breathe air. Not once. Which seems simple. But it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And if you don't believe me that it's amazing, and you don't believe me that it's automatic, let's make a deal. You say you're not going to breathe, I'll hold your face under the water. And we'll find out how much energy you can muster to get out of that deal, even though you've made the conscious decision to stop. God has made our bodies so incredibly, and it said he rested. I love that. Because when I think of rest, I think, you know, I'm somewhat out of shape. I know. Hard to believe. But if I was to run, like, maybe from here to that back wall, my rest is going to be much different than God's. All right? My hands are going to be on my knees. I'm going to have this strange cramp that they refer to as a runner's stitch. Um, <laughs> that should probably just be called an out-of-shape stitch. I don't think it's that kind of rest, like hands on the knees. It's just a bask and appreciate, and it's a setup for you. On the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. From all of his work that he had done, he rested, he enjoyed it, he looked at it, and he teed you up to be able to do the same thing. And look at that. Look, look at how graceful and restful that sounds. He, here's what the Sabbath says. You know that thing you do that's work? Just don't do it. Spend the whole day not doing that thing that's work. And then think about me. Think about all the things that I have done. And here's how I like to think of it. If you work in an office, if we're being honest, your job is to send email and go to meetings. So if you're like killing it on one particular week, maybe you send like 20% more email than you do. And you get up and you like kind of crack your knuckles, right? And you look at your weird scar on your wrist from carpal tunnel and that awkward brace that you wear that clicks on the desk because this is all you do for a living, right? You don't have an ergonomic keyboard that helps you out. Or maybe you, 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 get, on the, you get on your computer and your productivity says it's, uh, your usage is down, but your productivity is up like 20% on your phone. You're in all productivity apps. You're just slaughtering it this week. Or maybe you work for a landscaping company, right? And so you got all your properties done and you help that other team that's kind of slacking. You help them. The bushes look good. The edging is fantastic. People are jealous of it, right? You were super productive and you've done that for six days. And then you get to your day of rest and you think about God and all he did in those same six days. And you're like, dang, my emails and my hedges are unimpressive. And the same days that it took me to do all that goofy, unimportant stuff, God created the cellular motors and the neural networks that makes me do weird stuff. And the complexity of life and the, the, the complexity of reproduction, which I don't think I have to explain to most of you in the room. I may owe you a conversation. I don't know. <laughs> what God did is crazy. I mean, it's really complex. In fact, Scripture itself says that it was done so that you would see him. Um, we, we read in the, in the song, it says that God stretched the heavens out like a cloak. And it's so interesting to see scientists that look at the stars, talk about red and blue shift, right? They talk about the fact that you really, it's hard because you don't have a reference point, right? Like if a baseball was coming at you or going away from space, like if you didn't have a reference point to judge how close or far from you it was, it might just hit you in the face. So imagine looking into the uh, infinite nothing. Are, is the star coming at you? Is it going away from you? You can't tell. And so red and blue shift tells you that, and it almost looks like all the space is just being stretched and stretched and stretched. But really, how new is that light? I don't know. Maybe it was from a million years ago that you're looking at. What God did was crazy in six days. And you sent some email or trimmed a hedge or framed a room. That's what the Sabbath is for. 
It's not to be burdensome. It's to blow you away so that you sit back and you say, man, all the stuff that I do that keeps me so busy, that was so unimportant. God, in those same amount of days, created all the complexity of life. And now that I'm stopping from all my work to just sit and think, it really makes me freshly appreciate who God is because we get so spent up in a busyness of who we are that if we're honest, frequently we don't even give a second thought to God. It's almost like the creator of everything isn't even present. So it drives me crazy about a billboard that says God never fails to show up to our event. I'm thinking like, you mean the omnipresent God that's at all places at all times? Never fails to show up to your event. Cool. You got a sweet booking agent. If we look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, and this is another one to write down for this week if, if, if and as you're exploring these things. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to your Lord God, and on it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock, get it yet? Or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Set apart, different than all the other days is the Sabbath day. Four things in that text. On this one you rest. Second, you're to remember it and keep it holy. Third, it is to the Lord your God. And fourth, you're to remember that in those six days the Lord made the heavens and the seas and everything in them. And that fourth point is a healthy view of rest. Just remember on that day that the Lord made the heavens and the seas and everything in them. And that will, what they call, ground you. It'll remind you of who you are and who God is. Not to minimize our problems, but to a God who can create all things by the power of his word, that can stand up all of the complexity of life. I think he can handle our employment issue or the relationship with our mom and our dad. And we can rest in that. And so that pattern of Sabbath rest that maybe we, we kind of don't, we don't march in that same rhythm. We can miss out on the benefit of that rest that reminds us of who God is and who we are and helps us frame up our problems. Not to wipe them away and erase them, but to give us a graceful view of a God who loves us. A God who did all of those things, who pursues us with such a white hot passion that he would send his son to be the sacrifice for our sins and come after us with that. I hope you see the healthy view of rest and the Sabbath that the scriptures give. Because then people come and they mess it all up. They, they, they understand law to be legal, binding, heavyweight law. And it's a grind. But that's not the way the scripture has just presented this. This is to be easy and light. It's to take all those things that you do that are work and just say, just don't do those. Take the day, don't do those. Think about who God is. But somewhere along the way, somebody came up with like 400 other things that you're supposed to do on that day. And if you have a hotel building, you better have the Sabbath button. Which we talked a couple weeks about, talk, talk, talked a couple of weeks ago about that. Right? If you were to go to Jerusalem and get on an elevator, there's the Sabbath button, right? Or it'll be operating in Sabbath mode, which just means it stops on every floor because you don't want to do the work of pushing the button. Or the Sabbath mode on the oven that you may have where you can put a casserole in before sundown on Friday, and then it'll just crank up and cook that thing for you so you don't have to do the work of cooking. And all the burden that comes with that, all the weight of guilt that comes along with that. And then look at what the scriptures say. All those things you do that are work, don't do them. Hang out, think about me, enjoy some rest, high five your family, and remember I'm super big and you're super not. That's a healthy view of rest. 
And so Jesus now is on the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath day. And they're in the synagogue. And they've got this unhealthy, perhaps, view of rest and Sabbath and what they can and cannot do. And so they want to know, Jesus, are you going to heal someone on the Sabbath so that we can accuse you of working on the Sabbath? You see how petty this is? It's so petty. But Jesus is going to use this as an opportunity for they and us and for all generations to come to check our hearts. And I want you to think sometimes when you think about a hard heart, it's so easy to think about a hard heart inside of other people, right? And maybe you, you, you hear about sin or you hear about shortcomings and immediately you think to the person of your right, left, your rear, or your forward, or you, you think about someone else or gee whiz, I wish Sarah could hear that because Sarah is the biggest sinner that I know. John 3, 16 through 19. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. Because the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. That last verse there, verse 19, says the light came into the world. Cliff notes, that's Jesus. And the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Isn't that strange? Isn't that strange? To be confronted with the very Son of God, the spotless Lamb, and to love darkness over Jesus. To love evil over good. But this is in us. It's odd. And so Jesus lets them see their hard hearts. And the way that he phrases this question is so important Because what we see is a people who have built an entire industry, an entire way of life. And so they needed others to feel guilty about working on the Sabbath. They needed people to feel bad about this. They needed people to buy into this way of living because there is an entire economy that is built on this understanding of Sabbath. And so Jesus puts God's heart and motives on display Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 30, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. But Christian, you you might not believe that. Or maybe you believe it in word, but in practice, you don't believe that. In practice, you strap on a heavy lead-weighted vest every day and you beat yourself up over your performance. You might even hate yourself. Because secretly you think you don't live up to God's standards. And that might make you you treat people negatively. That may make you drag yourself around like Quasimodo looking for sanctuary somewhere with a lump on your back. Moaning and groaning to anybody who will listen and to people who won't. And just feeling terrible. And then we see Jesus talk about being salt and light in the world around us. To be drawing. To add dimension and flavor to life. But we're under a yoke. It's not easy and is burdensome, and Jesus never put it on us. This is why I say that God's heart and motives are on display in this passage. If you look at it, Jesus is living counter to their understanding of the Sabbath day. He's going to heal this guy, believe it or not, who may or may not even be in the story still at this point. He's going to heal this guy on the Sabbath day. And in, he, in doing so, as the spotless land of God, you know, not to tell you the end of the story, but he is not in sin by doing this. And they're going to want to accuse him because they're like, ha ha, we got him. But Jesus is going to give them an interesting conundrum here in a few minutes. I love when Jesus interacts with the Pharisee. It gets me a little excited. Um, 
probably sinfully so, right? Because there's probably a little more Pharisee in me than I like to believe. I pray that God weeds that out. I pray he weeds it out real gently, though, but definitely. Here's Jesus with this guy with the withered hand. One of his own creatures of creation, just like you and I. And he asks the question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? The strangeness of his question is really important. Because the positive side is kind of like a duh. Yeah. Um, if he had said, hey, uh, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good and to save a life? Maybe they would have said yes. Maybe they just would have sat there silent, which is you know, what they did anyway. Um, but it's the flip side of what he's doing that points to John 3.19, or at least the assumption that we have in John 3.19. Because in order to say it, it's lawful to do good, then they would have to accept then that it's not to do harm. And that's exactly what they're there to do. They're there to accuse Jesus of doing good. So they can't have one without the other. So they sit there silently because Jesus is exposing the hardness of their heart. They can't answer this question and get out of it. Because if they affirm for Jesus, then they can't accuse him of healing on the Sabbath. He's set them a little bit of a tiger trap. And their whole leg is in it. They were silent. They said nothing. They were busted and they knew it. Now here's what's interesting. Because this is effectively what happens to us when, when, when we come up to the edge. At some point in your life, I pray to God that he will expose you. I and mean, I'm saying if this hasn't happened, right? It doesn't need to happen again. If it already has, you're cool. But at some point in your life, I hope that he will expose you to the darkness of your heart and allow you to see, my goodness, I am separated from my God because of my own feelings. I don't want to be joined to him. What is that? And then by his grace, he makes you one of his miracle children. Because scripture says, none seeks after God. No, not one. That's a really easy math equation. So if he allows you to see that, then you come up to the choice of John 3, 19. Will you love the darkness more than you love the light? And that's where we see the Pharisee. They've come to see that they can't answer this question in the affirmative without incriminating themselves. And so they decided a hard heart. They plainly decided for a hard heart. And you see it soon in the story. But let's go to chapter, or verse 5. Excuse me. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. Again, like, I, I don't know how many words are attributed to this guy with the, with the hand, but it's, it's very few. So Jesus looks at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts. Jesus is in, in balance here. Angry, because this is effectively fighting against and resisting the very grace of God. And grieving because of the hardness of their hearts. Like we're just wishing. I wish you would just trust my father. I wish you would stop resisting. But you just, you won't. I'm showing you all this stuff and you just lean against it. You just hate the message. It's powerful to think of Jesus' righteous anger. Um, and I think we kind of, sometimes we want to cling on to that and say, well, Jesus was angry righteously, so, so can I be. I, I'm not going to conclude one way or the other that you can't have righteous anger. Maybe, maybe you can, but it's probably not as common as you would like it to be or you think it should be. I think we could try to lean on that a little bit too heavily and say, well, Jesus did this. Like, well, you're not Jesus, okay? I talk about that with discipleship all the time, right? It's like Jesus had a close group of 12 that he kept up with. I'm doing well if I can keep up with two. So that's why it's so important for us as a church to function as many members, not as one, right? Verse 6, we see the Pharisees' decision. They went out, they immediately held a council with the Herodians against Jesus on how to destroy him. There was never, they were never like thinking, well, you know, I'm kind of interested to see who this Jesus guy is. Let's, uh, we'll plant the guy with the withered hand in the room, and let's just see how he works it out. I don't know, maybe it's not sinful for him to heal someone on the Sabbath. I don't know. They came in knowing exactly how this was going to go down. 
they knew that Jesus was going to heal this guy, and they knew that they were going to step outside, have a little council, and decide, eh, we should destroy him. <laughs> I mean, doesn't that seem odd to you? That's a pretty hard-hearted decision, right? It wasn't like we're just going to slash his tires, and we're going to stalk him on Facebook a little bit and tell people, this guy's bad news. We're going to destroy him, not dox him. We're going to probably kill him. Because he just healed that guy with the withered hand who we trapped him into healing. This is a cold heart. This is a pretty extreme example of a cold heart, but it's also an opportunity for us to consider our own motives and think about ourselves. Is, is that in me? Maybe not to that extreme. Maybe to that extreme. Maybe you right now, in your heart, you just want to destroy someone. Maybe you fully, you're so angry with someone right now that you would rip them to shreds. Maybe you need to consider that. Is God in that? Is that the love of God that we're to echo and display as believers towards creation? That God cares so much for that he would send his son to live and die? And so now, in this gospel, it's on. The race against time is on. The great conspiracy to kill Jesus will start right now. And Satan's purposes to destroy Jesus will be used by God for the ultimate good. Is Satan going to succeed? Absolutely. Jesus is going to be murdered. And in the most incredible exchange in all time, God determined to pour his wrath against sin out through this crime of murdering, betraying, and doing damage to his own son who lived in all ways like us just without ever sinning. God determined to channel all of his wrath for your sin against that act, through that act. And so our salvation isn't God saying, hey, you sinned, but it's kind of cool. I like you, and you've done some good stuff. It's God saying, in my son, I forgive you, and you are made right through him. I mean, Jesus made that pretty clear. There's no way to the Father except through me, which means all those other ways you think come to the Father, that, that Oprah told you about, or De Deepak Chopra, if he's even still a thing, or whoever else is telling people about other ways to God, they're not right, okay? And I don't say that on my own authority. I say that on Jesus's, who says there's no way to the Father except through me. It's a pretty exclusive club. Except that it's completely wide open. And that's why I love the quote of the guy whose name I can never remember. And if I do remember it, I won't admit it because now it's a thing. It's like we're beggars who know where the bread is. And we get to tell everyone because it never runs out. That's the gospel. So we got to see three things. One, that this whole scene is a setup to show hard hearts. Two, gives us a healthy view of rest. And three, we get to see God's heart and motives on plain display. And so what can you do this week to engage with this story? First of all, you should have taken down three notes, whether on your phone, a notepad on the back of the bulletin, in your mind, if it's amazing. One is 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Read, read it this week and, and look for something in your life. You know, explore your heart. The scripture says that we're to test all things, which includes ourselves. God, am I being transformed daily through the renewal of my mind? Am I cold to your purposes, to your presence? Genesis 2, chapter 2, and 3rd, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. These are the passages that talk about what rest was. And remember that God's motives for you are good. The original fall in the garden was that God had some evil motives. He does not. That's a tired line, right? God's withholding good from you. You should just do this thing. He just doesn't want you to know something. No, his motives for you are good. Let's pray. God, we praise you. We love you. I pray, Lord, if anyone is in the room who doesn't know you through your son, and they see, God, that they're a sinning person, that their heart desires for something other than you, like John um, 3.19 that their heart reaches for the darkness rather than the light. God, I pray that you change that in them this morning. Make them available. Make them see the gospel. I pray, God, that they would come forward and pray together with us. Let us know what's happening in their lives. For those of us who have been a believer for a while, perhaps, God, I pray that you would re-encourage us by the depths of your son's mission, by the insane bent 
of creation for darkness that worked against him to plot and put him in awkward situations. And we thank you for his patience then and his patience with us now. God, I pray that we have seen that your yoke is light and your burden is easy. And that our lives should glorify you through joyful living, pursuing you actively and daily in joy in your presence. We love you, God, and we praise you in Jesus' precious, holy, awesome name. Amen.